this is a, a very important point of how we effectively accomplish a lot of the stuff with manipulating the blade, stability, lots of things. And it's a, it's a pretty easy one to kind of just pull it over. Uh, because usually when we first start sculling, we just get tossed into a boat, something like that, and, you know, kind of told to figure it out, and do, and usually it involves a lot of holding on really tight to the handle because we're afraid we're going to fall in because it's not surprising that the boats are unstable. So we grip tight, and that usually kind of creates a lot of uh, hand placements which are not very uh, beneficial long term, and we usually just carry them along with us as we get better, and, you know, we've got the rudimentary motion down and say, yeah, I know how to run now, I'm good. Um, not the case, because as we get further down along the way, what we're looking to be able to do is have enough control over the blade so that I can articulate where the blade is in space rather than relying on the flat surfaces of the sleeve to either, basically the sleeve's a lot, you know, set me up to kind of be either feathered or squared. I got two options. Or I, I mean, I could t potentially go squared the other way. That's about it. <laughs> the problem with this is that, <clears throat> as you probably have heard me talk about a lot, we are endeavoring to get this blade to go into the water when we are actually at full compression. This allows us to use the maximum amount of our body, which makes the boat go faster. And usually, whether we're competing or not, Speed moving to bow is usually high on our priority list right after not falling in. So what we want to be able to do is figure out how to be able to effectively turn this blade so that it gets into the water when we get to full slide. But as you've heard me talk about, we're very reluctant to do this because this twisting of the blade, usually we have a little bit of the blade surface on the water because it's stable. It makes us feel comfortable. It helps relax all these loved little parts of our primitive brain that say, stable environment, I can relax. As soon as we start tipping things around, we just, there's an involuntary tensing through the body which is very hard to counteract. So, to try to short circuit that, we have to find a way to maintain stability by keeping the boat more stable. We do so by put, applying pressure out into the pins. To do this, this means we have to have effective hand placement to allow us to maintain that connection as we move a curve in a curve linear motion. So there's a lot of things going on here. We had a, a friend down for um, the Learn to Row last was it, two weekends ago, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, sent a comment back and he was a yoga instructor and he's like, that's really hard. Because the boat's like this and you're trying to process like, yeah. You're only trying to do one thing, but it's really hard because your environment is tipping all over the place. So, to make this easier for ourselves, what we want to make sure is that we have, or we're moving towards, effective hand finger placement on the grip. Okay? So, most of us are somewhere here. You can kind of see. So, I, I've gotten into a habit of <clears throat> gripping with too much of my hand so that I have part of my palm or all of my palm in contact with the grip. This is not beneficial because then to feather and square I have to put a lot of bend through my wrist. This does not work well mechanically for me, especially when I try to go at high rates. And it also usually does not work well in terms of actually effectively articulating because I just don't have the same fine motor control here as I do here. I can grab things here. If I have to kind of like put it in a knee club, it's not going to work. So, in order to kind of give it, make it easier, I have to get the handle out into my fingers. How do I do this? Pose of a digit. So these fingers are all designed to draw things in. But hope, fortunately, I've got this opposable digit, which can oppose that motion. So if I set my hand up appropriately, I can wedge the grip in my finger so I can control how far it moves. This is good. So then I can then hopefully find a way to keep this grip out here so that I can then use more of my fingers to do most of the twisting of the blade. I can rely hopefully a little bit on the sleeve to kind of finish things off, but I want to have a little more control rather than just kind of trusting that something out here is going to do it all. So to do that, 
there are a couple things that are necessary. First of all, I have to have a, a, a somewhat good idea of what size hand I have and hopefully find a grip that is an appropriate diameter so that when I actually place my fingers on the grip, I can actually control it. If it's too big, I can't get my fingers around it. I don't have enough around the circumference. I don't have enough control. If it's too small, it just, well, like if I had a, the smaller, the smaller pink grips here, I would have a lot of trouble with this because it's just too small in my hand. I'd have to work a little too hard to get it. So I'm looking for something that's going to hopefully be able to wedge up here. If I've been rolling long enough, I probably have a little bit of callus down here somewhere at the base of my fingers somewhere, more than the average <laughs> member of the population. So this is good. Um, yeah, so wrong places, but hopefully as I work this more, my body starts responding from the friction and building up layers of skin. And so this I can actually use to my advantage because then I can actually use that as like a little like a stop gap, a little wedge, door stop, boom. And then I just wrap my fingers around. And here now, if I'm on the drive, blade square, my wrist is flat. And I can actually hang and use my body weight. And if I get into something like this, I'm much more inclined. Because right here already, you can see, musculature in the forearm is tensing. I'm shifting from a sense of hanging to a sense of pulling. So neurologically, I am much more inclined then to kind of do something like this to get the boat moving rather than just hanging on it. If I was going to hang from that bar up there and I wanted it to hang there for a long period of time, I'd have to kind of find some efficiency of effort. Otherwise, I'm going to fatigue. And the same thing I'm doing with a pull-up, only it's a horizontal pull-up. Okay? So, to get to this point, for most of us, is rather difficult because we've had a lot of practice doing this. And once we kind of put our hands on the handle, usually we just kind of like zone out. It's like, yep, I'm there. Okay, and there's all, there's all these other sensory things going on. Steering, boats tipping, blades in and out. So, to be able to really start to bring awareness to this, we need to slow the rating down, and we need to lighten up on the pressure, big time. So the drill I talked about, I think about a month ago, with actually taking your fingers off the handle, helps with this because I have less control. I have to like that. Trying to do full pressure, this is just not possible. But it then really forces me to pay attention to my hands. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to fall off. But I won't. And I can just work around and actually kind of play with, you know, can I actually work with my fingers more? Okay? And you know, some of you may have experienced this. You're doing this as a, yeah, my fingers are off here. Okay. <laughs> Say, look, doing something like this, and like, okay, we need to kind of just trust that, first of all, our hand is, I, very seldom have I ever seen anybody hand once they've actually, unless it's sometimes at the finish, at the release, a hand actually fallen off the handle on the drive. Or I, maybe like, I don't know, once or twice, tops, 20 years. Okay, it just doesn't happen. You have enough strengthen the fingers to be able to hang on to this. It's not going to like it'll rip out of your hands. So you can kind of shelve that fear. It's like it's not going to happen. The biggest thing really is just being able to hopefully have the dexterity the musculature here to do this. And if you don't, this is something you can work on. And then also just the awareness of what's actually happening down with your fingers. Okay? So we are moving hopefully towards a point where we are using our thumb, rather than at the end of the handle, somewhere down where we can get contact, somewhere here, so we have a surface to push against. The croakers are more challenging than some of the other grips that are more rounded, because you don't have as much surface area, but if there's a nice, more of a bevel, of a round bevel here, you've got more of a surface area you've got to get through. And if we're going to look at extreme cases, uh, is that group still there? Yes. If you would walk and right above the check-in, there's a blue croaker grip with a little notch. Yeah, bring that. We want to look at sort of the extreme example. We don't have to quite go to this is one of Jim's old uh, grips that he took off. You don't have to go quite this extreme in terms of pressure. You've actually worn it right off with his, 
<laughs> you don't have to do that quite hard. This is, the, this is pretty tough rubber. It's, it's oh, not like the stamp. Done that. Oh, my lots and lots of pressure over, you know, just simple geology right here. Wow. Just point tectonics. Um, we don't have to go to quite that extreme, but we do want to make sure that we are having a little bit of contact here so that we can actually push away and facilitate the feathering as our fingers open up. Okay? This, of course, means that our hands are open enough that the fingers are wrapping around the grip like this. So one of the places where it's usually more challenging to, to get this is usually at the, at the finish. I get to the finish, I'm going to feather, and so sometimes the grip will kind of pop back into my palm. No problem. I come up As I'm coming up on the recovery, I can just open my fingers up, assuming the rating is low and the pressure is light, come up, and then you know, I'm hopefully out here a little bit so that as I start to roll up, I am rolling the fingers. And I think I've talked about this before, but it bears repeating. From a mechanic standpoint, as we're coming up to the catch, if we are endeavoring here on the feather, if we are endeavoring to maintain pressure on this pin, as the oar is coming up here and here and here, we have to make sure that there is some vector of pressure out, and that is going to come not from the thumb pressing this way, but from our arms just spreading out as we do the curve linear motion. Okay? And the point that's going to be closest to our point of resistance here is going to be the pinky side of the hand. So, when I'm here, and you can just uh, step around to the other side of the blade, just provide me a little resistance, just, so just push against me. Alright, so, if I'm here and I'm just vectoring out, as I, as I provide lateral connection, the skin on the underside of my fingers just stretches a little bit. That's all I need, it's just a little bit of this. And I've got, I've got force all of a sudden, boom, going right into this. The trick is just to be able to maintain that as I do a curve linear motion, and then, as I do that, thank you, um, as I rotate it. And so the question is, how do I do this as I rotate it? Well, the best way of doing this is to link it up piece by piece so that I'm starting at the point that's closest to this. If I start this way, it's going to be much harder. Simple physics is sort of like leaning to the fall this way as opposed to Where is it again? So find it, maintain it as you move through. Okay. So, if we can do that, Maybe we've gotten to this point, we've gripped a little too tight and we're back in. Then, assuming we are light on the pressure and low on the rate, as we once we engage, we can actually open our hands up, relax our grip, and let the resistance of the blade scooping the water actually let our hand open up so that when we're on the drive, we can let our fingers hang more. Similar to what we were doing when we were doing one finger, we're just seeing like how little can I tense my hands and not let go of the handle, but still get suspension. That's I think uh, I think it was Sebastian or like one of you guys was, was mentioning how how less effort it took when actually Sebastian. Yeah. Just kind of like oh right, I can relax a lot. Like, yeah, the grip's not going. Anymore. But this is something that. All of this is, you know, you think of how many strokes you've taken even up to this point. You've taken a lot. This takes a lot of practice to unlearn. And so we want to keep the rating low. We have to go slow so that we can actually change the neuromuscular sequence. Otherwise, we'll just we'll zip right over it. We'll, we'll think we're doing something and we won't. So when I'm talking low rate, I'm talking like 12, 10, low, low rate. Can you go over the fingers again? I think I'm doing them in reverse. Yeah. So, out, out What are board. you doing with your fingers? Pardon? What are you doing exactly? So starting it's, with it's, the fifth finger and it's moving the, the It's the sequence of where the, where the contraction starts from. So I have, here. here's my, if we're going to look at this in terms of inboard and outboard is all relative to the pin. So this is my inboard hand, the inboard part of my hand, the outboard part of my hand. So I'm starting with the outboard um, in the inboard part here, so lateral aspect of my kind of moving out from my body. Pinky side, and I am twisting from the pinky finger first. And then from there, I'm moving through the rest. 
So it's with the feathering motion. It's not it's with the, the pushing it's towards the, the pin motion. Well, both. Oh. The squaring, it's the squaring up motion. So hopefully, when I get to the finish, pressure is out, elbows are out, shoulders are relaxed, everyone's, you know, I'm starting from a good place. Good. I've got lateral connection. If I don't have this, if I find that the boat falls down, most likely, at some point, right at the finish or the release or somewhere just prior to that, you know, tenth of a second before, instead of following the arcing motion this way, I've done this. So the collar has now separated from the pin. And then I've tried to take the blade out. So I've gone from a boat system that is as wide as the oars, very wide and stable, to now a system that is only as wide as the hull. Not stable. And so if I don't do that precisely, exactly right from balance, the boat won't stay set. Surprise, surprise. That's way too hard. I'd, make, I'd like to make it much easier. If I keep pressure into this, I got a much wider system to play with that's going to be easy. So, if I get that, I feel like, okay, I'm coming to the finish and the release and everything feels good and stable as I take the blades out of the water. Okay, good. Then, I've got, I know I've got at least some sense of lateral connection. Pressing out this way. Then I maintain that, pushing out, as I move my hands back together. And then, the more challenging part, as I move this way. Because as I'm moving this way, I'm actually starting to curve back out. So if I follow the linear path that I may be conceptualizing, hands away, linear path, linear path, linear path, now the collar is moving away from the oarlock. It's not going to, hopefully at this point, for most of you guys, it's not going to move away this much, but the pressure will. And at some point in the near future, hopefully in the next 50 years, Somebody's going to develop technology where we can actually get readouts in our lovely speed coaches of how much lateral pressure is on our pins as we row. And we'll be able to get the immediate readout. But okay. since rowing is not bicycling, um, technology is not something we're really good So don't hold the breath. So we're going to come up, and as we're coming up, we have our blades flat on the water probably or somewhere horizontal. We're like, oh, this is very nice, but now I have to change the orientation. So as I'm Maintaining lateral connection, if I have it, I have to twist the blade. So to maintain that connection as I twist, it is most beneficial to feel the sequencing of pinky, then ring, middle finger. Usually hard, by the time you get that, you don't really need much index finger. To get to your question, so it's this yeah. sequence here. And for those of you who want just a little more information, you'll assume your brains are not totally full. They are. <laughs> for the video, at least, then for review, the outside, here, the index finger, as we're coming up, if we can maintain ample lateral connection with the inside part of the hand here, pinky side, as we're coming up, we are endeavoring to keep this the weight on this part of the finger light, which will ensure that as I come up and then have the blade squared, it goes to the washer, which is important. No sense of being square and then going, hey, look, Mom, I'm square. It's like, that's great. You're supposed to be in the water because that's what makes boats go. So I want to make sure that I'm, as I'm getting further into this, as I review these videos in the future, I have lateral connection here, and I'm, as I'm getting up to the catch, the index finger is light. Because the more weight I have here, I'm going to be able to observe even just this distance between here and here. And you notice this when you go to wide grip. Boats tippy. Boats more stable. More leverage here, less leverage here. Better lateral connection here, closest point, less here. So this is just like if you're going to be sweeping and you're going to do one, you know, inside hand versus outside hand. Inside hand, outside hand. It's just on left hand. Okay? Any questions about that? How do you do that at a rate of 12? <laughs> so the slower you That's go, really the slower you go, then hopefully on the drive, you'll be able to feel yourself first, open your fingers up. So all you're looking to do is feel the scoop of water, you get resistance, and then as you get resistance, you relax as much of your body as possible, and particularly the forearms, so that the fingers actually start to open up. You can kind of let the, let the grip start to slide out into the fingertips. You know, maybe you know, like how, we'll play a game. So, how far out can you can you go without losing the grip all all the way? Which is also kind of some of what you're doing when you're doing 
you know, from one finger off to here. Yeah, same thing. It's like, okay, I've got to really lighten up in the pressure so the grip is so bad. So I've got that. When I get to the release, and I've, I've already hopefully set this up, then I'm in a good position to push with the thumb to feather and open the fingers up and boom. Now, hopefully, I've got to a point, you know, it's not too hot out today, not sweaty, good tack on the grips. I can open the fingers up and my wrist is still flat, no contact here, I'm on the feather, I'm all set to go. And then I come up to the catch, I roll up, boom, still space, level wrist, all good to go. If I look down and I see on the recovery, you know, wrist bent, notch like this, like, ah, let's readjust that, let's try to get these wrist level, so I'm hopefully just tracking Nice and smooth. Is that right? Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Low rate, very light pressure. Practice it. <laughs> Feel like you got a rhythm of it, and try it. You know, with a little, a little more pressure. Let's see where you start to lose the feel. Okie dokie. All right. Okay. All right.